Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, the invention of the microscope, though so many years ago, helped doctors to understand how bacteria can cause and transmit infections in humans. Now, using genomic sequencing, researchers are discovering that communities of bacteria known as the human microbiome do much more for us than we ever imagined. And the Mayo Clinic Microbiome Program, which is part of the Center for Individualized Medicine, actually researches the relationship between the microbiome and health and disease. Here to discuss the human microbiome is the chairman of the Department of General Surgery at Mayo Clinic Rochester and the director of the Human Microbiome Program, Dr. Heidi Nelson. Good to have you, Dr. Nelson. Thank Thanks you for so being much. with us. Yep. Thank you so much. So when someone come up, comes up to you and says, you know, what's your, what are you doing? What are you researching? When, and you say, well, the human microbiome, and they say, well, what's that? Duh, what do you tell them? What? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Well, in, in many ways, I consider it to be a bit of a missing link in our understanding about our own health. We think about our own genome and the contributions of our own genome towards our who we are and our health, but we really have ignored, uh, because we haven't been able to study, the genome of the bacteria that populate us. So we are trillions of bacteria. We have bacteria uh, in our airways, in our intestines, on our skin, uh, throughout our body, in essence. And while we used to think of them as being strictly infection problems, pathogens, if you will, that caused uh, illness in people, we now recognize that they're uh, abundant amongst us and they are part of our health. They actually help us uh, get vitamins out of our food. They help us with cofactors. They are very important for our immune system. They s help us sort of set up our immune system. So we're learning a lot about their contribution, not just as illness, but as just a part of our normal health. And there is such a thing as a healthy microbiome as opposed to a less healthy microbiome. And that's a uh, part of what we're trying to study. So a microbiome is basically a population of bacteria. And in this case, the bacteria that are, that are good. They're, good, they're the good guys. And they help us do things and they, they don't cause disease. A healthy population is the key there. It's like any ecosystem. If you have the right healthy population of bacteria that are in harmony with each other and uh, do the functions that we need them to do for us, then the harmful bacteria are not as likely to get into that space and to cause problems. I'm kind of thinking about when someone is sick and, you know, your mom says, oh, well, she got a bug or they've got a bug. Um, a better way to look at that is the bugs are out of balance. If you, if you consider your microbiome to be the things that are living on us and in us, the bacteria, the bugs are just out of balance instead of, oh, I caught a bug. That's not what happened really. Uh, well, you, you can catch a bug. I mean, you can have an external exposure um, to certain bacteria that then, you know, it, anybody is going to get a, an infection mm -hmm. with that kind of a high volume exposure. But there are chronic conditions where there's probably an imbalance. We often see in our studies that low diversity of bacteria then allows sort of a expansion of the rare bacteria that can cause problems, creating metabolites that we aren't normally uh, used to having in our systems, for example. Um, the C. difficile problem that many people uh, might be familiar with when you take antibiotics, you can get the Clostridium difficile infection, the colitis, and that probably happens because you take the antibiotics, you, you knock off some of the healthy bacteria, and then sort of the the less healthy bacteria, which are there in small numbers, become there in larger numbers. It's kind of like having weeds out of control uh, in your system, in your yard system. So if you have too many of them, it can be uh, a problem. It, th then they create uh, complications by toxin release or other uh, just invasion. So how do you go about studying the human microbiome? Well, where do you start? What do you do? And what are you trying to find out? Well, that's a great question. We take samples from a variety of places, no matter, depending on what you're studying. I happen to be interested in the intestines for the most part. And so we can take samples, and then we can prepare those samples by extracting the DNA uh, from the bacteria. And you can fingerprint bacteria. They, uh, they all have a certain uh, identity through genome sequencing. Um, but you can also then take it a level below who's there 
through just 16S sequencing to what genes do they have and what are those genes going to do? Are they going to create a toxin? Are they going to create a metabolite? And sometimes it's simply the creation of a metabolite that causes a symptom or a problem, either in the intestine or it can be a metabolite that gets in the circulation and causes a problem that can be manifested elsewhere besides the intestine. The antibiotics that we take are one of the things that kind of damages that microbiome. What else damages the microbiome? We're just, just antibiotics only? Uh, no, I, we don't know exactly mm. what all damages the microbiome. Um, we think that what you eat has a lot to do with whether you're continuing to populate a healthy microbiome. Um, it all comes down to biochemical interactions. Uh, but, you know, probably things like, you know, uh, chemotherapy, maybe radiation therapy, any number of different factors uh, probably, you know, shifts the normal population of bacteria, mm -hmm. anything that is exposed to them. Uh, but we don't know f factually all the answers to that question yet. We have some ideas. Can you give us an example of, of <clears throat> a research that has led to a better care for a particular problem? Well, we're a very young field. You know, sure. the earth sciences have been looking at microbiome for a long time, but in health, it's only been really in the last five to ten years that we've even understood that they exist. Um, we're getting a lot more insight into many problems. Um, uh, to be able to predict when somebody's microbiome population is too far out of range, like in Clostridium difficile, a fecal transplant is used to restore that community of bacteria um, that's highly successful. So that's one example, I guess, of a, something that's in the clinic right now. But that's a good example of what might be coming down the road. What yeah. uh, You mentioned C. difficile. What are some other um, ailments that people can experience if their microbiome isn't healthy? Well, we do know that the microbiome contributes, for example, to rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's going to be a longer story to figure out how to solve that. But, um, the, again, people with rheumatoid arthritis, Arthritis have a lower uh, community structure, we say low, lower diversity, and then they have certain bacteria that are more prominent than they normally would be, and then they create a metabolite, or there's a metabolite that part of the immune complex is that causes the joint problem. So how do you reverse that is a key question, and that will take some years to s sort through the strategies to reestablish normal. So you now have the ability, let's say someone that had taken antibiotics and they got C. difficile and you identified that in their stool. You now have the ability to go in and test that person's microbiome and find out that it's abnormal, give them a fecal transplant, and then uh, figure out, uh, take another sample and find out that the human microbiome has been, the normal micro microbiome has been restored? Well, clinically we use the presence of C. difficile and the presence of colitis symptoms, refractory diarrhea, and they can't get rid of the, no, the high abundance of Clostridium difficile. That's the marker for treating them with a fecal transplant. They're symptomatic. You can't fix it uh, with um, any other traditional approaches. But we are studying what happens to the microbiome, and mm. we do see it's like any other transplant you see engraftment that occurs um, to, that indicates that you've really restored the normal situation. That's what I just was going to ask too. Is there any research being done on how to repair someone's microbiome? That's the secret uh, uh, initiative. I mean, that's what we really have to get to. And for that, we'll probably have to turn to ecology principles to say, if you have this disruption how do you return to normal? Because it's going to be some kind of interaction between microbial genome and human genome and immune system that we'll have to sort through. There's a host contribution, microbe contribution, probably diet contributions that we have to solve. Some will be simple if it's simply just restoring diet. Um, but some may be more complex. We'd love to have you back when you get it figured out. Exciting <laughs> stuff. Dr. Heidi Nelson, Chairman of the Department of General Surgery and Director of the Human Microbiome Program, Mayo Clinic. Dr. Nelson, thanks so much for being here. Thank you.